Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In a world where most things cost money, and those costs seem to be going up, the word free gets our attention, all by itself. And while not everything you see out on the curb is worth picking up, there are a good number of people in Nashville who make it their mission to help others for free. Need books? Check. How about food? Check. Or maybe you need more than just things. Later this hour, we'll talk to people who provide free stuff for the folks in their communities. But first, workers' rights don't always get a lot of attention. But two new Tennessee laws now going into effect are intended to provide more benefits to some workers who suffer on the job. One would eliminate a marriage penalty for the surviving spouses of people who are killed in the workplace. The other will provide PTSD counseling to firefighters for the trauma they experience. Both close gaps in state workers' compensation laws. WPLN's political reporter, Blaze Ganey, has been following those laws and the debates surrounding them, and he joins us now. Blaze, welcome back to the show. Yeah, welcome. Well, thanks. Yes, good to have you. So there's two laws. At first glance, they might seem very different, but they have a common element, helping workers. L let's start with the one that addresses the marriage penalty for the surviving spouses of people who are killed on the job. Tell us about two women who got this penalty reversed. Yeah, so Kara Jordan and Candy Garrison were the ones who worked to get this law passed. Uh, both of their husbands died uh, in a forklift incident that happened at the Packaging Corporation of America factory in Counts, Tennessee. Um, while the incidents happened several years apart, the two women bonded together over the tragic incident um, and lobbied lawmakers to change the laws that they called problematic when they were going to get their workers' compensation benefits. They found a bunch of you know, exclusions, things that they couldn't do while receiving benefits. One of those was be remarried and also mm. any uh, children that were dependents could not, uh, would stop receiving money if they did not go to college at 18. Um, so those things were reversed and they also raised the money that uh, they would be allowed to get families in the future. What impact will changing this law have going forward? Well, the biggest impact is that you know, if someone were to die young and their uh, surviving spouse was young also and later found somebody they wanted to marry, they could do so now and continue receiving benefits. Also, the biggest change for children in these situations is they'll be paid up until they're 22, uh, right around the time most people in college, um, this, whether they go to college or not. Now, it was another widow who was behind the push to get PTSD treatment covered for firefighters. This was also about addressing a hole in the workers' comp law. Tell us about Jennifer Samples. Yeah, so Jennifer Samples testified in committee about the financial hardship and struggles her husband had when trying to come forward with these problems. You know, as men, uh, we often don't want to face these issues that we really have. Um, so it took him a while to do that. Once he did, there wasn't much help on the other side. Uh, the workers' compensation did not want to uh, say that the PTSD was tied to anything that he experienced while at work. So that they didn't cover it there. And then he basically had to foot the bill for most of uh, you know, his treatments and whatnot. So why does she believe that her husband, Dustin, might still be alive today if PTSD treatment had been covered? Well, if it had been covered, he would have been able to seek the help, uh, probably would not have had to go through the financial hardships that on top of PTSD would only make, you know, those conditions worse. And so if he was able to seek, get the help he needed, she believes it would have been able to be treated and handled. Now, one of the people you spoke to while reporting this story is an attorney who specializes in workers' compensation. He said that there are just some examples of how Tennessee's system is failing workers. He blames a law that passed a decade ago that overhauled workers' comp. What are some of the other things he would like to see change? Yeah, so one of the things he was most adamant about was going back to having elected judges oversee these workers' compensation cases. The last change allowed appointed judges to handle them. He feels that it takes away from the emotion and personal touch that an elected judge would have because they are 
usually from that community and understand the needs of the people in that community, whereas an appointed judge is sort of on the outside and not uh, voted on by those who they may be seeing. All right, last question for you. I'm really curious. What drew you to these stories? Well, it's pretty rare that there are benefits for people over companies. And in this case, it was an insurance company. So usually I'm stuck doing stories about culture war bills and just talking about the numbers on the budget. But this was a different story that really touched the hearts of families um, both impacted and those that will be impacted in the future. That was WPLN state political reporter Blaze Ganey bringing us up to speed on a pair of workers' rights measures that passed the state legislature this spring. You can find the link to his story in today's episode post at thisisnashville.org. Blaze, as always, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your reporting, my friend. Thank you. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll meet some of the people who help others by providing stuff for free. Do you know about free resources in town? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil e. Colonna, and this is Nashville. The saying goes, the best things in life are free. The air we breathe certainly is for now. But jokes aside, we all know we are living in a time where costs for everything are going up. And to be able to afford basic necessities is a challenge for a lot of people. That is where free resources can help. Now, it's not a panacea to people's problems, but it does help them when times are tough and also shows that someone out there cares. Free resources help individuals, families, and entire communities. My next guests know this well. Lisa Tullis Williams is the founder of the Buy Nashville, Buy Nothing Nashville Facebook group. And full disclosure for our listeners, Lisa is running for Metro Council, although that is not what she'll be talking about today. And joining her is Esmeralda, a member of the Buy Nothing Nashville group. Lisa Esmeralda, welcome to This is Nashville. Hi there. Thank you. For, Hi, thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Now, Esmeralda, you've been a member of the Buy no- Nothing Nashville for a little while now. Tell me, how has it helped you? Oh, my gosh. I, I wouldn't know where to start. You know, um, it all started back in 2021. Um, my daughter's birthday was coming up and I had no money. Um, you know, I was going through violence, domestic violence and stuff, which we winded up homeless for 10 months because I left them. So somebody referred me to that group and I got accepted and I was kind of scared to post, but I did. So when I posted, they showered us with love. People started getting her gifts. People were very supportive. You know, I did not get judged. I did not, you know, it has been such a beautiful and still is an experience for us. And we just finally got housed after being homeless for almost 10 months. And like 90% of the things we have here at my house have been from the Buy Nothing Nashville group, Mm. you know? And many know that I don't have no transportation and I didn't even have to worry about that because people were coming from all over the place to come and donate, you know, for us that we needed. What does that that mean to you that people would come from all over the place to help you out in a time of need? Oh my gosh, I have disabilities and I was, you know, just getting out of, a domestic violence situation, I felt the love. Mm. I honestly felt that I matter. I felt the love and I, it, it has lifted like a thousand pounds off my shoulders, Mm. you know, to be a single mama in need and for people just to come with no strings attached to come and just give you items that you need has been such a big blessing in our lives, you know, and it has made a major positive impact in our lives as well. Now you're talking about how you were helping, 
you know, how, how the group has helped you as a single mother with young children and you're unable to work. How has the group really helped you out? Like you've gone and turned to help young mothers specifically yourselves. What kind of assistance, yes. what kind of assistance yes. does Buy Nothing do for young mothers? Well, for young mothers, it gives them like the basic needs, like like, like a, a toddler bed, a formula, uh, clothing, you know, things like that. You know, like like my me being connected to Buy Nothing Nashville. I, you know, help a lot of young mamas. I, I connected them to them too as well. And now they're getting things that they need for their families. You know, um, it, it has been such a blessing. It has made a big difference in our lives. And this mama, they call me and they tell me how happy they are. And some of them, you know, one of them was crying the other time that, you know, she, she received what she needed for her son. Mm. You know, to me, that makes it all worth it. You know, to, to, to know that there is a community out there that really does help. You know, it changes our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, Le know? Lisa, what was the catalyst for this? Where did you get the idea? So we started By Nothing Nashville about, ooh, 10, 12 years ago. So uh, we actually predate the official start of the By Nothing Project. And it was started with a group of friends that were in a Bible study together. We were a part of a group called Moms of Preschoolers. And there was... I would say there are eight or 10 of us that our kids were just staggered enough in age that one of us would have a child that outgrew a size of diapers and we'd have a sleeve left over. And so we would say, hey, I've got size three diapers. Who needs them? And we would trade off. And to coordinate that, we started a little Facebook group. And that grew from that eight or 10 mom saying, I've got clothes that my child doesn't wear anymore? Does anybody have a pair of shoes that I can borrow to take on vacation? Does somebody have a, a pack and play? We've got friends coming in to visit that we could borrow for a few weeks to a 20,000 member group wow. that spans from just over the Kentucky border to down into Alabama and about an hour each way outside of Nashville. We are all of Middle Tennessee. We have members like Esmeralda who are coming out of these extraordinarily difficult circumstances and getting their feet back under them that and Esmeralda is a great example. I'm so glad she's here to talk today because she turned around and said, hey, I'm at this location and they don't have toys for kids. Does anybody have age appropriate toys that they could bring by? And I know some of our members dropped off some things for children that were three months and under and that were a year and younger for those those children who were, you know, in, in that situation where you, you do literally leave with just things you can carry. And mm -hmm. um, it's been such a great experience to see how people will post, I, I need, but then they'll turn around and say, I have this to share. It's it's just so great to see how people in and around Nashville, they just share and they give. And we are such a great city in that way. Well, how does it work? Well, um, first you, you join the Facebook group and then you just post a little thing that says, I need, or I'm in search of. And then you could say, I need newspapers. I'm learning how to paper mache and I, I need about 200 newspapers. And somebody else will say, oh, I've got three or four. Um, where are you? I can bring them to you or I'm in Germantown. Can you pick them up? And then you coordinate how you would exchange those items. Or you say, hey, um, my kids were really into coloring with crayons and we've got a box of broken crayons. Who can use crayons? And somebody who's doing another project will say, oh, I can use crayons. I'll come and get them. Or maybe you've just moved and you have a stack of boxes that you don't need anymore, but somebody else is getting ready to move. And so you coordinate exchanging those items. Um, and sometimes, like Esmeralda mentioned, that she um, uh, relies on people bringing things to her so you can you can bring them to someone. Or uh, we have a gentleman one time who said, hey, I've got a pickup truck. Who needs to move things around? He spent a weekend driving furniture back and forth that people were donating right now. I think we have about six sofas that are up for grabs okay. um, of, of different colors and sizes and variations. Okay, so um, from sofas to people assisting you move the sofas, what are some of the most popular items that people are giving away? Oh, this time of year, moving boxes are very popular. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it can be everything. It can be everything from coffee mugs. You know, it, it's a lot of... Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm new to Nashville and I, uh, I I'm looking for an Instapot, or it could be um, I'm I'm helping my parents downsize and we have records and books and uh, we've got a you know beds that we need someone to come and help take for their their home. It's everything and anything. We have had people give away cars. Mm. We have had people um, offer uh, dog sitting services. It's physical items. 
it's your time, it's your abilities. So it can really be almost anything. Wow. Now, my next guest has been helping folks in Nashville for years, <laughs> starting with a little free library in front of her house. Michelle Summers, thanks for being here and welcome to This is Nashville. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure to have you here. So you provide free books for people. Why did you decide to do this? Well, um, I saw uh, free book libraries in the subways in Atlanta, in every subway stop. And I thought it was such a good idea. And after I had the little free library in my yard, I wanted to get books to other people who couldn't always get them. And I came up with the idea of the cart libraries in places where um, people who can't use libraries, the metro libraries, come or gather. Now, tell me about the little free library in your yard, the initial one. Yes. When you went to set it up, what was your thought process like? That maybe somebody would come by and get a book, and I and and I could share books. But um, it's busy all the time, and um, I have a um, newsletter that goes out, an email newsletter talking about things that are going on at the library, and um, about the progress of the little free library cards. And I understand you have a background in education, right? I do. I'm a retired Montessori teacher. A retired Montessori teacher. Yes. Okay, so how did that inform this drive to provide this great service to people? Well, I, um, you know, I taught reading, so, and I've always loved to read, so. Wonderful. Now, if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kalio Lake Alona. We're talking this hour about free community-based resources in our city. Do you know of free resources around town? Tweet us about them at This Is Nashville. Now, Esmeralda, I understand you actually just got something this morning from the Buy Nothing Group. Is that right? Yes. Um, a lot of people know that I have some disabilities. I need a knee replacement and I have some back issues going on that prevent me from working and I can't afford anything because I'm only living on the government assistance, which is TANF and that's on, that's nothing. So somebody, I posted a few days ago that I needed an electrical wheelchair and people kept on commenting, commenting and I finally today picked up a free electrical wheelchair. Mm. I am so happy. You know, I'm excited because now I'm able to do more more. I'm able to, to get out and do more. So it has truly, truly been a blessing. And I'm so excited. I was in little donuts at the little place and, you know, hmm. it was hilarious. <laughs> I, I, can, I can hear the smile on your face. Now, you know, ask me this, answer this for me. You know, the cost of living is going up and the affordability of Nashville is becoming more and more of a question for a lot of people. So tell me, why are things like Buy Nothing and this group, why is it so important? It is important because it changes lives. It changes, it honestly changed me completely. You know, to, to know that there is a group out there that truly cares, you know, that truly is helpful. You know, even if it's just to give a resource, because there's another resource that they connected with me that I actually go to every two weeks to pick up free food. You know, to have these resources, it's a life changer. No, Lisa it really is. Lisa, what surprised you about the experience of running the Buy Nothing Nashville page? The friends. Mm. I I started it with, with a little group of, of other moms that I knew. What I didn't expect was that I would build other friendships. It really is a community. There are people that I have met that I would have never met any other way. We don't live next door to each other. Our kids don't go to the same school. We don't participate in the same religious community. And so being part of... By Nothing Nashville meant that I was able to interact with them, to communicate with them, to discover shared interests. Um, and so it's been this really great experience of building friendships in neighborhoods that I didn't know about beforehand uh, and getting to know people in places that I, I maybe wouldn't have gone otherwise. Mm. So it's a really great community builder and a really wonderful friendship finder. So it's really made you feel more of a part of Middle Tennessee. Exactly. Now, it's a, also a national project, as you mentioned. Do they help your efforts? here. They do. So the National Buy Nothing Project has a website that all of the, um, actually anybody can go on the website, but the administrators for the different Buy Nothing Projects around Nashville. We have over 20 micro groups around Nashville as well that are neighborhood specific. They provide um, materials that you can post on your group. Um, ideas like talk, 
so everybody's heard of Taco Tuesday. So it might be a, a Tips Tuesday where you would encourage people to post a specific item that they might be looking for. Like it might be Mugs Monday. So everybody's going to share coffee mug ideas or like mug cake recipes. So it's uh, the, the national group tends to uh, offer up ideas to do those community building projects. And uh, our groups do participate in that. Um, Buy Nothing Nashville specifically is such a large group that we we don't do those very often because we are very active. We have over 100 posts a day happen on our our page. Wow. And so we we feel that adding those pieces doesn't necessarily um, encourage interaction the same way. But on some of the smaller groups to kind of keep people talking, we'll, we'll post those those interactions. OK, now we got a tweet at This Is Nashville from Wickadella. Quote, we have a blessings box outside of our grocery store in Kingston Springs that has non-perishables and such in it for locals who need assistance. The rest is courteously restocked as we restock it as we go, end quote. And that's really awesome. Now, Michelle, tell me, who supplies the books that you distribute through your library cards? The books are donated to the to the little free libraries um, for different promotions or publicity that I've gotten. People have called and donated books. Um, perhaps their parents passed away and they're getting rid of their library or um, they're moving and they don't want to take all of their books. So I have all the books at home stored and cataloged. And as I fill the little free library carts at the different um, shelters or area um, resource centers, then I use those books. Okay, so tell me, where are some of the other carts located around town? So there's um, a library cart at Loaves and Fishes. Um, there's one at St. Stephen's. Catholic Church in Old Hickory. Uh, there's one at the Catholic Senior Center on McGavick Pike. And uh, I even have a franchise, what I call a franchise library cart in Clarksville, where um, I taught a group of people how to set up their own. Mm. So, And the, the newest one that's going to open is um, at the Nashville Foster Love Closet to help foster children and foster families build libraries for their the people who are staying with them. Now, are you just providing books only or doing magazines, crossword puzzles, other materials, literature type yeah, materials? Um, I do uh, magazines, crossword puzzles, uh, even um, little chess games or checker games, uh, different things that people might use. Um, they have uh, a selection of Grocery sacks hanging on the edge of the library cart. So when people take books or things, they can put them in a grocery sack mm -hmm. and take them with them. Uh, so especially if they're homeless or and they can put it in their backpack or attach it with it and keep the things safe from the weather. Now, I understand you also keep people whose English is not may not be their first language. You also keep them in mind, right? Yes. Uh, I have a large selection of Spanish English books. Um, especially at the Catholic Senior Center, where a lot of the families are um, immigrants or um, families from Spanish neighborhoods that are coming to the Catholic Center for services. Now, in October 2021, News Channel 5 ran a story about people clearing out and taking all the books from free libraries around the city. Has anything like that happened? Yes. The book, the little free library in front of our home was burgled um, at that time. Um, there have been other instances, but ours seems to have been um, burgled just during that initial phase. Unfortunately, it was October, so all of our children's Halloween books mm. and all the adult mysteries were taken have you ever given any thought to why someone would do something like this? No, I I can't imagine why someone would steal books. It's interesting. But, yeah, I can't yeah. imagine either. Now, no. now, Esmeralda, tell me this: you've you've gotten support through this informal community, but what could the city be doing? What could they be doing more to help people who are in need? I honestly, I, I believe what we can do as a community is just reach out more, you know, expand, you know, expand the groups and, 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 and advertise more, you know, because I did not know about this group, you know, unless somebody else told me, you know, somebody else had to tell me about this group. I didn't know a lot of groups existed until someone had to tell me, you know, uh, when I was at the homeless shelter too, um, they don't know about this kind of stuff. 
because nobody tells them. So I think as a community, we all need to work together. We all need to stand up together and, and be a, lend a hand to one another, you know? I understand that. Now, Lisa, tell me, can anybody, can people can just post anything on Buy Nothing Nashville? Like, what are the guidelines? Well, you can't post anything that's illegal. Okay. Um, we, um, as Buy Nothing Nashville, we do not allow animals to be traded. Some of the smaller groups do allow that. Um, as the Buy Nothing Project, uh, overarching rules, uh, pets are allowed to be traded, but not within Buy Nothing Nashville. We've had some concerns about animal safety. Um but other than things that are illegal, um, we don't allow alcohol because we can't check ages. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say just use your best judgment. Think of it as something that you would want to pass along to a neighbor or a friend. Um, so things that you, um, you yourself would be willing to accept from a neighbor or a friend. So maybe not dirty socks, you yeah. know, that, that, that you know, just wash them first. Exactly. Um, but be considerate of others and, um, if somebody asks for something specific, um, we did have someone one time ask for uh, potato chip sacks, like because they had an art project they were doing and they had figured out a way to fold them into these long pieces to make baskets. Mm. So even if you think it might be trash, there might be somebody who wants it. So um, th we do we do have some we do have a few rules, but um, just if you come on our page, they're very clearly posted, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Have any businesses reached out to you with items that they can no longer use? We have we have had some people post. Um, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to being a business, we do not allow business pages to be part of the group. You have to be a person. Mm -hmm. We ask you to be your real person profile. We'd, we'd prefer it to be the actual person exchanging with other people. That's part of the relationship building. Um, but we have had people who have businesses that um, we have uh, one gal who had had an embroidery business and she was um, shuttering that. And so she was giving away T-shirts and embroidery materials, um, the fabric, the, the threads, that sort of thing. And so, yes, we have had uh, businesses pop in there and give things away. Now, Esmeralda was talking about how, you know, more people need to know about this. And in mm -hmm. 10 years, you all went from a handful of people to 20,000 people right. in this area. So how can more groups, how can how can they find a greater sense of communication so that it's not so rare that, that people understand that these organizations and groups like yours exist? We are purely word of mouth. We've done no advertising. We haven't bought Facebook ads and done a big push. We just accept people where they are and... Um, offer help as we are able to do that. And that's how we've grown. We've just tried to be good people and been there when people had a need. Michelle, what are you hoping for, for folks who are in need in town, for all of the services, the services you offer, the services Lisa offers and others? That life will be easier and more enriching um, and that people will a be able to have access to the things that they need within the prices that they can afford. And if they can't afford anything, that they would have access to books, they would have access to diapers, they would have access to formula, um, so that life is better for everyone in Nashville. Mm. Esmeralda, final question for you. What do you want folks who may not have very, very, very much challenges in providing for themselves and their family, what do you want folks to know about people who may be in need at the moment and what it takes to help them. It doesn't really take much to help somebody. All it takes is for you to open up your heart. You know, it could be as simple as a pair of shoes you're not wearing that you just have there sitting, you know, at home. That could be a blessing to somebody else. You know, like me, for example, um, everything that, that was donated to us, we did not have. And it's just a simple fact that because somebody opened up their, you know, their homes, their heart, their arms to help us. You know, um, they made baby, they made uh, my birth, my baby's birthdays possible and Christmas. And, you know, this, this group has really, really been a life changer for us. It's made our, our lives a whole lot better, much easier, you know, so I'm thankful. I am very thankful and blessed, you know, for this group and all the loving and caring people that are out there mm. who truly care. I want to thank my guests, Esmer Esmeralda, a member of Buy Nothing Nashville. She was joined by the founder of Buy Nothing Nashville, Lisa Tullis-Williams, and Michelle Summers, who started the Little Free Library. Thanks to you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate it.
We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn about how using free, free resources helps bring people together to build community. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Kaliole Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking about free resources in our city. Now, before the break, we talked about some of the tangible things that are being given away to people in need. Things like books, clothing, toys, and furniture. Yet, a physical item isn't always what people need. My next guest discovered a way for people to talk with the loved ones they've lost. I'd like to welcome Allison Young, the creator of Tennessee's first wind telephone to This Is Nashville. Allison, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So you created the wind telephone. Now, I'm sure some listeners are wondering what this is. So help us out. What is a wind telephone? The wind telephones are all very different, but mine is a booth that is in my front yard. It has a disconnected rotary phone inside of it, and people are able to use that phone to have one-sided conversations with people who have died or who they have otherwise lost. So people can come to this phone, have a conversation with someone they've lost. That's really, really beautiful and also incredibly heavy. How did you discover this idea? Um, the first one was actually built in Japan. Before I went into nursing, I was a Japanese major, and so I stay up on a lot of things Japanese. And I had found out about this one, which was made in fall of 2010, and became completely obsessed with the idea of building one myself. So obviously it had been a few years, but I was finally able to do it earlier this year in February. Now, I understand that you're studying for your master's in thanatology, which is the study of death, dying, and bereavement. How does, how does things like having a wind telephone, how does that expand our understanding and our relationship with grief and death? So the big thing is that it continues what are called continuing bonds, that people are able to maintain relationships with people who have died. Those relationships are changed, but they are still very strong and people need to be able to continue communication. You told us a little bit about the booth. I want to get into more detail. Okay. You have a rotary phone. Yes. <laughs> Why a rotary phone? Because of the meditation that goes into it. Mm. It's not just quickly dialing a number like we're used to doing. You have to actually take the 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 wheel and push it around, wait for it to go all the way back, and then you have to do that 10 times. Mm -hmm. So you can't just run into the booth and immediately start doing anything. You have to really f get focused by having that little bit of meditation at the beginning. Now, look, a lot of young folks have no idea <laughs> what a rotary phone is. Do you have, like, instructions for how to use that for them? I've actually considered if I need to do that. Yeah. But so far, I haven't had... I've, I've had a couple of very young children come and use it, but they have quickly figured out that if they put their finger with a number that they can either do it themselves where they just kind of poke mm -hmm. or they can do the full uh, rotation and kind of leave it up to their parents. That, that, I wonder how folks, how do folks use it? Do they need a, a reservation? Do they have to make an appointment? No, it's open 24 hours a day. I have a solar light in the top of it so that people who keep odd hours or have um, job jobs that take them... Um, out late that they can still come out and use the wind telephone with no issue, that they won't be there in the dark. Okay. Now, you know, there's a lot of other ways that people can get free resources. There's a lot out there. We can't possibly cover it all in one show, but here to talk about a couple more options are McCall with Maypop Farmstead, a farm that contributes to the North Nashville Community Fridge and a newly familiar name around here. Elizabeth Burton is the co-administrator of Skate Nashville. She's also a producer for This Is Nashville. McCall and Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Hey. Thanks for having us. Really a pleasure. So, now, McCall, I know you're not the organizer, but for folks who may not know, explain to us how the community fridge works. 
Um, the community fridge that we serve is just a literal fridge that has a little shelter built over it outside of the Elephant Gallery um, on Buchanan Street. So anyone can come any time of the day, same um, to drop off or take anything that they're needing. Um, yeah, so serve, self-serve. That's really cool. Tell me, what role does your farm play? We have committed to um, bringing three CSA shares every time we have a three a CSA, which uh, in the spring season was three times a month and the summer season is two times a month, along with just like any eggs that we can spare. The eggs are always going the fastest. Um, so we make sure to drop by the community fridge at least once a week. We try to get there twice a week. Um, anytime we go to farmer's markets, any leftover um, goods that didn't get sold from other farmers, we offer to just, you know, be the surrogate that takes it to the community fridge for them. Now, for people who may not be familiar, can you explain what a CSA is? Yeah, a CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. Um, so most CSAs are set up where, like, you'll pay at the beginning of the season and then get box every week or biweekly or once a month. Uh, we try to be a little bit more accessible with how we go about that. So you can pay per box or at the beginning of the season or at the beginning of the month. But it's basically just consistent community or agriculture support. Why is it important for you to be more accessible with that? Because food is important and having good <laughs> food is important. Um, and yeah, I mean, I there's so many different things that can be done to make food more accessible, like putting food that people can get for free in the community fridge or just like offering food for a lower price on a sliding scale or offering, you know, instead of paying $900 up front, which is totally not accessible for most of our community members, um, to pay $35 to $50 a box every time you pick it up. Now, Elizabeth, the Skate Nashville Skate Library, are you loaning out skates to people? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We have some skates that have been given to us by brands. And we also, when people are tired of their old skates or want to upgrade to a better set, we have them donate them to us so we can distribute them to other people. Is it all kind of skates, four wheels and rollerblades? So most of it is um, quad skates right now. We do have some inlines, but our group has kind of shifted towards quads right now. So primarily quad stuff. So tell me, how does the program work, basically? So what we do is we have a bin set up at our skate meetups, and you're able to go through the bin. If you need some new knee pads or something like that, we may have some in your size, or you can let us know, hey, I'm looking for a size small in elbow pads. Can you get those next time? We'll talk to some of our brand contacts and see if they can donate something, or we'll put a call out on our Facebook or Discord to see if anyone has stuff that they're willing to donate. And you can just pick it up at the meetup and come join us to skate. So you're getting items from the community, used mm -hmm. items from people, but you're also getting new items from your brand contacts. Yes. Talk to me about the brand contacts, the items that you're getting, and also how you guys set that up. So I have realized that cold emailing is a very powerful tool. Hmm. Um, I literally just went on the website of every skate brand, gear brand, wheel brand, I could think of last year and just emailed them and said, hey, we're setting up a skate library and we're also having this big event. We had a big event last summer that we were giving away prizes for. And can y'all donate something? And some said no and some said yes. Um, we got a lot more yeses than I expected. At one point I had like a mountain of stuff in my house mm -hmm. of like probably two, three thousand dollars worth of skate supplies, like 15 pairs of skates, all kinds of wheels, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, yeah, that's how we've gotten stuff from our brands. And we just put the call out to the community. If you have extra stuff, you can come donate it that way. Now, I know some skateboarders who are very, let's say, finicky about their gear. Do you have folks who are picky about what they get? I am the folks. Okay. I am very picky about my gear. Um. And there's a lot of us who are. So part of what this idea was born out of is there are some people that we wanted that were telling us they wanted to get involved with skating, but there was a financial barrier to doing that, um, especially if you're park skating on quads because you have to make a lot of upgrades to your skates um, that really add up. Um, most people are skating on a bare minimum five six hundred dollar setup which is really expensive five six hundred dollar setup yeah. to get ready for skates i mean that's a long way from the days where we used to tie the skates to the bottom yeah. of your shoes and I'm, I'm dating myself but that's how we had to do it back in the day yes things have changed inflation okay. yes but um 
And so people, so people are pretty picky. I'm pretty picky. But one thing about that is that we have a lot of people in the group that are very picky. So if I buy a set of wheels that I end up not liking, I'll contact. I was contacting a friend saying, "Hey, do you want to try these? I'll try the old ones you had." And we realized there was so much of that swapping within the group. We said, "Why don't we just set this up formally?" And you can just dump them in this box at this meetup, and someone else can grab them later when they want them. Okay. Now, if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about some of the free resources provided in our city with Allison Young, McCall, and Elizabeth Burton. What free resources have you found helpful around town? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Now, McCall, you've been farming. How'd you get into this? Uh, My family is in agriculture, definitely different side of agriculture, monocropping, all of that. Um, In college, I worked on a farm that was set up a little bit differently, labeled themselves as regenerative, um, which is a whole different side of agriculture that I didn't have exposure to as a child and really fell in love with it. Um, My mom is a veterinarian, so I do have some background in like animal animal husbandry and care in that way Um, and was in the food service industry and really I care about eating. I care about what I eat. Um, and have just really enjoyed the process of growing it. So that's kind of how I got plugged in to where I'm at now. And so you having this experience learning about restorative, regenerative agriculture, how, how did that kind of inspire or influence what you're doing now? Um, I think that it all really connects back to like my whiteness and being a white person that is in agriculture and is making my living in agriculture um, on stolen native land and how that you know, people still don't have access to food and that really goes back to white people and colonization um, and taking away like the food forests that once were here and kept up by native folks. Um, So yeah, just really acknowledging like what has happened here and naming that and trying to do what we can to redistribute and make food a little bit more accessible. You, you're talking about really helping out people. A lot of the food you provide goes to the community fridge in North Nashville, as we mentioned, which has areas known as food deserts. What type of impact are you hoping it has outside of feeding people healthy food? Um, yeah, I hope that, I mean, for us personally, like we try to post online about the community fridge as much as we can because we're really not doing anything big or you know, that wild or out of the box or anything. It's like the community fridge is a set up resource that anyone can use. Um, even if like you're just a person that picks up a few extra groceries or a person that wants to like make some extra dishes and label them specifically, they have instructions for how to do that on their Instagram. Um, but just really trying to like encourage other people to do that because the more support that the national community fridge has, whether that be food coming into the fridge or you can make donations through Venmo, the more locations that will be accessible and Obviously, with more locations, I think more mm-hmm. mouths are being fed. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Allison McCall's doing things to feed the physical body. You're kind of doing things to help feed the soul and the spirit. Tell me a couple of questions, but first, who can come and use the wind telephone? Literally anyone. Anyone at any time of day. Yes. You know, has someone really shared their experience with you of using it? Like, what has stood out to you of people who've shared what it's been like to use it's actually already been in a documentary Mm. and in that documentary they did make recordings of people's um, conversations on the phone and they were just some of the most deep heart-wrenching you know people asking um can you send a bird can you um you know i was just waiting for you to come back around Mm. just things like that that were just so personal and so loving. And um, I also get notes that are left in the the telephone. And I have had only positive reactions from people. They've been very thankful for the, the, the wind phone. Seeing that this is an area of focus and study for you, mm-hmm. right? And also a life interest. What have you learned about death and grieving from this experience? All that I've really, when I started my studies, I didn't know anything about continuing bonds. And that's been the biggest thing is learning about healthy ways to grieve through continuing bonds by using the wind telephone. Mm -hmm. So that's 
that's what the the my thesis was about. And so it's something that I put a lot of study into. Yeah. I mean, personally, in, uh, last August, I lost a mentor, the mentor who influenced me to come and take this job, as a matter of fact. And I was kind of frozen for a second, didn't know what to do. This is someone I would come to, not with all of my problems, but guidance and a true mm-hmm. friend. And so I would have these conversations with him in my head. And sometimes they would come out loud. And I just noticed how much, how much better I felt in that in those moments and to hear what you're providing for folks here to actually go to a phone and have that actual phone conversation so I can call up Chuck and tell him all the great <laughs> things that are happening and all the all the mess that I have to deal with. Um, <laughs> it's it's really tremendous. I'm curious, how many wind telephones does Tennessee have? Um, right now, when te- there are three in Tennessee. So there's one that is opened in Maryville and there's one that's opened in Clarksville. Uh, I'm also curious, what do you think will happen if we had more of these available to people? It would be great to have it in other sections of, I mean, we have nothing in Memphis. We have nothing in Jackson, nothing in the Tri-Cities, so uh, nothing in Chattanooga. So it'd be great to have a lot more places where people can use this kind of mourning tool, Mm -hmm. um, grief tool, so that they can get through what they're needing to get through to make it a full, survive. <laughs> a full benefit for yeah. the community. Elizabeth, tell me, how does the Skate Library bring people together to form community? When I first moved to Nashville, going to a Skate Nashville meetup was the first kind of social thing I did, only a couple of things after I, a couple of days after I moved here. And so many of the people that I met at that meetup, including my friend Heather, who's my other admin for this group, those have been the friendships that I've maintained the whole time I've lived here. And we really feel like not being able to afford skate should not be a barrier to, to getting into that community. And I also feel like it's so important to like McCall is doing prioritize the necessities that people need, like food, clothing, all that kind of stuff, similar to what we heard from the buy nothing group. And it's also really important to let everyone have access to just fun and community. So I like that we're able to do that. And we we hear people all the time saying that, oh, now that I have skates, I'm going to be at this meetup and we see them and they bring friends and mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. So it's just that community aspect and just something fun to do, which I think is really important. This is volunteer. You all are doing it on your own time. What challenges do you all face with the operation? The biggest challenge is that skates are heavy and gear is big. Um, So we're really just kind of storing this stuff at our houses. And in an ideal world, when we get a message on Instagram and someone says, hey, I live in Murfreesboro, can I get some skates? I would love we could shoot down to Murfreesboro and give them some skates. But that just is not realistic given how big Middle Tennessee is and how many people we have as a part of our group. Um, so that's the biggest that's the biggest operational issue, just the fact that we don't have enough time to give everyone what we want to give them. And skates are heavy. And I'm I'm just a girl. <laughs> a strong one, now. <laughs> a very, very strong one. Okay, now we got a tweet from Alejandro Guizar. It says, quote, I'm so glad you're doing this episode. I'm doing a project where I connect new immigrants to resources. The most surprising resources I'm glad to tell new Nashvillians is that Meharry General Hospital provides free health care to all Davidson County residents, end quote. That is really good to know. And to keep those posts coming, McCall, what other kinds of free resources would you like to see made available in the city? we got about a minute left. Just more, I mean, that has connection to what I do, more food resources, more community fridges. I know that there used to be one set up on Dickerson, um, and it comes with, like, a lot of codes issues for being able to, like, safely keep a fridge just, like, outside. Um, Yeah, so I think there's a lot of, like, local laws that sometimes stand in the way of that. But, yeah, just encouraging folks to donate to the community fridge directly so that the people that are organizing it can make more of what they're doing because they're doing really great work. Now, Lisa, what does it say to you about the city that people are really entering into these types of initiatives? Yourself, McCall, Elizabeth, our guests earlier, Lisa and Michelle. What does that tell you about Nashville? Well, I've lived here my entire life. So it's just a very different place than it was because we've become so uh, diversified that it's been really wonderful 
to see the the differences that have happened while I've been here for 38 years. Mm -hmm. Allison Young is the creator of the East Nashville Wind Telephone. She was joined by McCall with Maypop Farmstead and Elizabeth Burton, co-administrator of the Skate Nashville Skate Library. I want to thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville. It's a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Elizabeth Burton and our senior producer, Steve Perouche. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Candon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tuthope. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Alex Lockwood. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville, find us on Instagram, and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Colonna. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody, and be good to each other.